Paul, writing to the church of Colossae, um, said, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up in my flesh what was lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I have become a minister according to the stewardship from which God, which he has given me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the rich of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in wisdom that we might present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which he works in me mightily. For I want you to know what great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea and, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love and attaining all riches of full assurance and understanding of the knowledge of the mystery of, of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now I say this to lest anyone should deceive you with, um, with persuasive words. Let's pray. As the Lord, we don't want to be um, uh, deceived by pers persuasive words at all. Father, we come before you. We want your word, Lord, to um, fill us. We want to hear the words that are written on this page, Lord, written deep in our hearts, Lord, in our, in our souls, that we would just reflect on them, Lord, that we would allow you and we allow your word, allow your Holy Spirit to have that transformation work that you desire to do. And we ask right now that you would do that, that you would have your way, that you would work beyond our hardness, our calluses, God, our distractions. We don't know how to work beyond them, Lord, but we trust you do. And we know you do, and we ask that we, you would make, you would look at us, Lord, individually and do that for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Well, today we're in a passage of where we see some of Paul's callings and some of his, some of his ministry. Um, he talks about like what, what God has for, for him to do. And I mean, Paul's ministry, I mean, it's vast in, in, in scope. And I think we would all say without anyone protesting, this guy was effective in his calling. I mean, is this guy's life a matter to the extent that we even look at him today and go, like, here is a person that not only impacted his generation, but he's a guy who impacted generations to come, I mean, even to where we are right now. I mean, here's a guy who lived a life in such a way. I, I mean, this is a guy that lived a life that pleased God, that brought a smile to his face. Now, I don't know about you, but, like, I'm after that. I'm after bringing a smile to God's face. I, I like that. I like that. And so here we see in Paul a, a man that was one of those people that did that, who used his life and really maximized the potential that was entrusted him to the fullest. I mean, the guy obviously had these huge gifts and qualities. I mean, no, no doubt, no doubt about it. But, but even he far exceeded what was entrusted to him by using his life in a measurable way that impacted even us today. And what I want to do in our time together is I want to look at this measurable way that Paul lived, which, which he shows us here, and kind of look at and draw out from there what What's the grid that Paul ran things through? And so what we're going to find today is it doesn't really matter what stage of life we're in. This all can start right now. It doesn't matter where. And we can all set ourselves in a place right now or where we turn and seek to just bless God's heart. I have a friend that's um, very accomplished in his field, and I'm not going to tell you what the field is. a large field, though, and he's like one of the top people in his fields. I mean, the guy has 
collected more degrees. I, well, he collects degrees like oh, people used to collect stamps. You know, I mean, he's got, he's written peer pra papers, he's, uh, these positions that he's achieved, the, the amount of people that kind of try to surround him, you know, because they're jo jockeying around him, trying to, you know, get known by him or whatever. It's just unbelievable. And one day we were hanging out together and we, and we were talking, he doesn't believe in Jesus yet. And, um, and we were talking about life, and we were talking about Jesus, talking about faith, you know, and we were, we were talking about that. And he said to, to me about his life that, that he's been in this rat race. And this is exactly what he said. He said, he looked at me and he said, and I have been a good rat. So what's it for you? Are you like a, a rat chasing after a, a piece of cheese, a rat chasing after something? My clicker here because I won't get far without it. Or are you like Paul? Paul said this, he said, I fought the good fight, talking about his life, right? I fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I've kept the faith, and there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but to all, all but, but to also all who have loved his appearing. Paul says, this is, this, this is what I have awaiting me. I have this crown laid up waiting for me. Is that, is that what you have? Do you have that? Or, is it, or are you chasing after some piece of cheese? You in some maze? Is that what you are? Some race chasing after? I, mean, I, I don't know what that maze is or, or, or cheese is for you. I mean, it could be the, 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 the maze to succeed or whatever your definition is of success. Or it could be the maze to be better off than I was five years ago, ten years ago. It could be the, the maze to, you know, get the next thing thing that, I'm, that I want to add to my life or the next fix that I'm after, whether it be of alcohol, drugs, or pornography, or I mean, even just like um, a pat on the back as far as that stuff goes. But you know, you and I, we don't have to be rats chasing after a piece of cheese. And it's easy to say, it's no doubt, it's easy to say, but these are Chasing after cheese is, is the default setting of, of these, these lives unless we choose to do something different. And, and what I love about these scriptures that we're looking at today is this is the personal stuff of Paul's life. This is Paul like exposing his, like Ron and Angela, they're just exposing their hearts. And, and, and that's what Paul's doing. He's exposing his heart to, to us and saying, look, this is, what, this is what I do. This is what I found. And, and really, this is some of the stuff that makes me tick. This is the stuff that I run my grid, that I run life through, that allows me to live in a measurable way. And so Paul, I mean, a guy that's probably impacted the world the most out of any person that's walked on the earth outside of Jesus Christ. And that's not an exaggeration. Paul is a great guy to learn from. He is one of those guys that's like a been there, done that, know what I'm doing type of guy. You know what I mean? He's got it down. Like I used this example before. It's like you don't you don't learn how to fix your brakes from somebody that's never done it successfully before, right? You just know, if somebody has said, oh, I fixed lots of brakes before. They never worked afterwards. You go like, well, I don't need to learn it from you, right? It's just, it's just the way of it. Paul's a guy that did it right, that did it right. Like years ago, years ago, and it was like 20 years ago, but I still remember it so, so clearly. I was driving my car with a friend, and we were listening to the radio because, you know, we used radio back then. Remember that? Um, so, and we were listening to radio, and um, it was a public radio, and they were kind of like doing their thing there, and they were interviewing this lady who had just wrote this breakthrough marriage book. Breakthrough is going to revolutionize all people's marriages and all this. And this lady was on, and I, I don't believe I'm absolutely correct here, not exaggerating, she was like on her seventh marriage at the time. So, you know, in the inter and she, this is like right up front, you know, she's married, happily married to the seventh guy and, and all of that. And she's, you know, they're going through how to have a healthy marriage, kind of giving some insights on this book to tease you to kind of buy the book and all that. But then the, finally, the interviewers asked her the question. 
Isn't it kind of ironic that a person with seven marriages would write a book on how to have a healthy marriage? And she answered without, draw, without, without a pause and said, who better to ask than a person like me with so much experience? <laughs> and a friend of mine that I was, I was riding with, he said, hmm, that makes a lot of sense. And I turned to him, I said, no, it doesn't. That's stupid. You don't learn from a person. <laughs> you don't learn from, you, you want to learn from people who have been married for a long time and who have done it and done it well and who are doing it well, have a great relationship. That's who you want to learn from. When I was early um, in, my, in my Christian walk, so it's all around the same time, um, there was this young Christian author. He's like in his 20s at the time, uh, young early 20s, and he wrote a book on raising children before he ever had one. Any, before he had any, I should say. Um, and his premise was this. His premise was this. All we need is God's word. And so, you know, I can write a book on marriage, and it's going to be accurate. Now, he has since apologized and all of that for writing that book. But the fundy inside of me was like, oh, yeah, that sounds right. But the fact is, is no. No, we don't. We don't need just God's word. We need each other, too. And we need other people. That's why the scripture tells us that older women are to teach the younger women. Or an older man are to teach the younger men. Yes, we need the word of God. Absolutely, we need the word of God. But we need the word of God in people who have put it into their lives and are walking down the road with a doing life that could come along other side of other people and saying, this is how it all works. That's why we emphasize life groups here. We're not just because we want a program in the church. We've got better things to do than have programs, right? But we, we need life church because we, or I'm sorry, life groups because we need community. We need a place of where smaller groups where we can be real with one another and we could pour into each other's lives and we could say, hey, I'm struggling with this. Anybody else ever struggle with this thing? And other people could go, yeah, I've been there. I know what it's like and I know how to walk this path. Isn't that the value of Ron's testimony? Angela's testimony? I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the real deal right there, right? I mean, we need community. Without community, this, this stuff's impossible. Well, all that to say is that, like, Paul is a, a good example for us. He tells us at times in, in his own life, in the, in the writings um, of the letters, he tells us, follow me as I follow Christ. If you want to know what it's like to follow Christ, just look at my life, because I'm going to be doing it, and you can pattern your life after that. And so that's a guy we want to hear from. And so he has this grid. It sort of comes out in here that we, that we see, and it's, and it's like this grid he sifts things through that allows and allows us to look at it and follow in his steps of where we also can have this measurable life that, like, brings a smile to the face of God. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to work our way through the passage, and as we're doing it, as we're gaining understanding of the passage, we're going to highlight certain areas of this grid, of this structure that, that we see in there that allows us to filter things through as we live life. So let's look at verse 24. Now I rejoice. Oops, that's gone now. There we go. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I fill up in my flesh what's lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of the body, which is his church, which is the church. If you haven't noticed, the church is a big deal in the New Testament. And we'll see it over and over again, because there is no substitute for the community of believers. There's just not. God doesn't have a plan B on that. There's, it's the community of believers. But notice what, what Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings. And sufferings were a huge part of, of Paul's life. I mean, suffering for the purpose of seeing the gospel reach those who it hasn't reached yet. And you know, there's two groups of people who the gospel hasn't reached yet. Those who have never heard, never heard about the wondrous work of Jesus Christ that's available to us and the empowering of the Holy Spirit that he gives to live this new life. And the other group of people are those who have heard, but, but the gospel hasn't reached because it hasn't penetrated the core of their beings. It's still up in their minds, maybe, but it hasn't penetrated their core. And so for these two, for these two groups, Paul, Paul suffered a lot. Now, when it talks about 
filling up in my flesh what's lacking in the afflictions of Christ. We're not talking about adding something to the finished work of Jesus Christ. We're not talking about that at all. And what I mean by that is Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Jesus died on that cross to provide a way that anyone at any time, no matter what their lives are like or what they've done, where they've been, how wicked they've been or how wicked they are or lack of wickedness that they are, Jesus' death on that cross will provide redemption for anyone who calls upon Jesus and believes. So it's just the way of it, okay? Now, that's going to have an effect on my life. And so when I'm coming close to Jesus, you know, like we talked about before, there's this exposure thing that happens. And that exposure of, of my sin, of my shame, of, that exposure is going to see repentance happen in my life. And that is there's going to be this remorseful sorrow over my sin, over my shame, with a desire to turn from it. Now, the resurrection of Jesus Christ that happened three days after the cross, after his death, provides a way for new life, access to new life, and access to the power to live this new life. So as Jesus died and rose again, so too, when we come to Jesus, our old way of life is dead, and we are given this new life in Jesus Christ. I have been made spiritually alive, and that's called a lot of things in the New Testament. It's called regeneration. I've been regenerated. I have been enlightened. I have been born again. All those things. I am, as another passage says, I am a new creation in Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm new. That work's done by Jesus Christ on the cross. What we need for that new life is done by Jesus. Paul's not saying I'm adding to that work when he says I'm filling in my body what's lacking in the afflictions of Jesus Christ has nothing to do with the aspect of salvation. But what it does have to do with is what Jesus left us to do. And that is get that message out to everyone everywhere. Give all an opportunity to hear of the redemption that you and I got to hear of. And give everyone the opportunity to respond to it. I think in America they say you have to hear the gospel somewhere around seven times before you respond. That's just the way of it. Most places in the world, they don't have that luxury. If they get to hear it once, that's an amazing thing. But we still have that call to give everyone an opportunity to respond. Now, the cross doesn't do that job. That job has been given to us. And here's the thing. In order to do that, it's going to require sacrifice. If Paul says, that's, that's what I'm doing. I'm going to bring this message out. And you know what? There's sacrifice that goes around it, and there's afflictions that go around it, and I'm not getting around that. And that's, what, that's, that's exactly what happens with us as well. Paul sacrificed. It cost him to carry this message, but he counted the cost, as Jesus said, to do that. For Paul, that cost, that cost was a whole lot of suffering. It was beatings, it was arrests, it was false accusations, it was people hating him. But the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ does not reach anyone without some form of sacrifice. But here's the thing, and it's important for us to realize, where we shrink back from sacrifice, sacrifice, a sacrifice that God's asking of us, qualify that out, right? So where we shrink back from a sacrifice that God is asking of, of us, there's also going to be the shrinking back from the fullness of life that Jesus wants us to enter into. You just can't have it a different way. And see, and the problem with that is like we see that we see like, oh, this is going to require sacrifice. I'm just going to pull back from it. And, and Jesus is going, no, 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 that's the way to fullness of life. But we don't see it on the front end. We only see it from the hindsight. That's how, because we look at it now, we look at it now and go, you know what, man, that's going to be, that's, that looks a little painful to me. That's just a little bit too, that's a little stressful. For, there's an easier way out. There's other things that will be less demanding. There, there, there's other things that, you know, I can do it a little bit simpler than, than that. And besides that, somebody else will do it if I don't do it. And you know, I don't have the time or I can't afford to do it anyway. And listen, Absolutely, yes, 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 there will always be, there will always be a door out of any sacrifice. There always will be a door out of sacrifice, but what you'll find is that door 
is the only door into a life that's well lived and that impacts eternity. So that's the door we're turning from. So the grid, we get to the grid we're talking about here, and I think it's very evident in Paul's life, is that he made joyful sacrifices. And for us, man, we need to make a joyful sacrifice. What, what sacrifice is it that God's asking of you, of me, right now, currently? Like when I leave this place, what sacrifice is he asking of me? When I'm driving my car, what sacrifice is he asking of me? When, when, I, when I go home, what is it where God's going to say to me, I, you're going to say no to your flesh here. I'm going to ask you to say no to your flesh. I'm going to ask you to endure this suffering here. What's the sacrifice he's doing? Because the kingdom of God does not advance without sacrifice, but it must be a joyful sacrifice. And you could try to see it another way. You could push back on that and all that, and and that's great. But the kingdom of God is only going to advance by sacrifice and sacrifice that's done joyfully. Let's look at verse 25. And so he goes on and he says, so um, for the sake of his body, which is the church of which I have become a minister according to the stewardship from, from God, which was given to me to fulfill the word of God. And so he says, I've, I'm a minister of the church. I'm a minister of the church of Jesus Christ. And I'm a minister of Jesus too. Every follower of Jesus is a minister to the church and as a minister of Jesus Christ. It's not like some professional title, you know, that's been given. No, this is something that we've all been born into. But Paul said, and so, but I'm, I'm not only a minister, I've been given this stewardship from God. Other translations call it administration. I've been given this administration. Some translations say dispensation. And what it is, is it's this layer of revelation. He said, I've been given this layer of revelation from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, which is verse 26, um, which is the mystery, which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints, to the believers. So he says, I have this revelation, this layer of revelation that God gave to me to reveal to the church, to the church. And so I want to, we're going to talk about that just a little bit. Because he says it's been hidden from ages and generations. So in other words, Old Testament, if you go through the Old Testament, they didn't see this. They didn't see it. It was hidden. I want to look at a couple of angles here and um, address a couple of things here. What we see here, what are the takeaways from this little section. Um, first off, I want, to, I want to say something. Christianity is older than the earth that we stand on. It's just that there were elements of Christianity that were hidden for generations before Jesus Christ. That's, that's all. But it's always been there. Not, not, um, not, all, um, not all the revelation of Jesus, not all, the revelation of the church wasn't given before, before Jesus rose from the dead. But, you know, thousands of years before Jesus even walked on the earth. God's been revealing the truth about Jesus Christ and was preparing the earth for what was going to happen. I mean, you go all the way back to the original fall. There, Adam and Eve just blew it, and God meets with them. And Genesis 3.14, God says he's going to send a redeemer. He he tells Eve that he's going to send her seed, because the woman doesn't have a seed. Her seed is going to crush the works of Satan. Well, Eve knew what that meant, that there's going to be some Savior who's going to redeem us from the mess that I just got done, that we just got done making. Okay, and so the first thing she does when she has a child, she, she thought that was him. And she said, she called his name Cain. I've gotten the man or I've gotten a man. She thought that was the fix from the fall, from sin entering the world. She was wrong, but she knew the promise of God. She, she knew, There's a promise here. And we can move on through Genesis, Genesis 22. You get Abraham doing this funky thing where God told him, go sacrifice your son Isaac up on this mountain that I'm going to show you. And he's real specific about it in three days and all this stuff going on, all these things. You don't understand what's going on there at all if you don't know the gospel of Jesus Christ and the father offering his son on that cross. You don't understand that story at all. You can't understand it. 
But we see it revealed there, and on and on. We go through the Old Testament. And so, and so there's stuff that's been hidden. I mean, there's over 300 promises about Jesus before he ever walked. Um, but it's been hidden through the ages. It was revealed after Jesus rose from the dead. And Paul was one of the people that revealed it. He was given that layer. And so some people will come along and say, well, you know, Hinduism's older than Christianity, or Buddhism is, uh, they just don't know what they're talking about. There was information that was hidden that has now been disclosed that we get to benefit from. And here's the information that was hidden. It's in verse 27. To them, to them, to the believers, it says, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, the non-Jews. That's us, most of us here. Um, the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, no other generation knew about this. He says, you have been chosen to participate in this. This is the dispensation that you have now entered into. Your generation got to see and gets to see what no other generation saw before Jesus, and that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, the sealing and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit the, the way for God to actually dwell among his people and have the sin issue and shame issue taken care of didn't exist before Jesus. Oh, yeah, there were, there were things that, that God did and God provided, okay? I mean, there was the temple. You could go read about it. We're reading about it on at Life Church. There's the temple, and then there's these animal sacrifices, and they weren't some primitive, you know, ideas of how to appease a deity. They were honest core known facts that everybody knew and people even know today and it's that this sin wrecked everything and I've been cut off from God and the only way back is through the death of something and I'd rather it be something else than me because I want to be able to touch with God. And so God did the temple, and God could be who he is, holy, righteous, and just, and still be, have a way to live among his people by the, by the sacrifices and by the temple, but it was limited by location, by, pe by the priests, by atonement that only covered sin and couldn't take away sin. But God had a plan. God had a plan. God designed us to walk with him and, to, and for us to be able to talk, to talk with him. And be able to follow him. And so when the time of Jesus came and he died on the cross, that's where all our sin was taken away. It was removed. Atonement for us means the removal of sin, removal of shame. Because of the resurrection, we have this ability to have new life and walk in it. And when we call upon the name of Jesus, the scripture says not only are we saved, but the Holy Spirit comes and he seals us and indwells us. This is something that for people before Jesus for thousands of years longed for. And they had no clue about it. They never saw that. They never thought of the day when that could actually be a reality in somebody's. You could actually, God, the Holy Spirit could dwell in you. You could be led. You could talk with God no matter where it is that you were. Listen, David, David was a powerful man used by God, wrote a lot of the Psalms. Holy Spirit was upon him, empowering him, in him. Scripture will even say at times. But here's what David said in the midst of his sin and the wreckage of his life. He said, don't cast me away from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. No, no believer in Jesus Christ can pray this because God says, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing it because this is what we have. Contrast this to Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you also trusted, talking about Jesus, whom you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were, listen, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption, the purchase possession to the praise of his glory. Again, not just Ephesians, 2 Corinthians as well, almost the same wording. Now, he who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed and, and has anointed us is God, who also sealed us and has given this, us the Spirit um, in our hearts as a guarantee. Thousands of years, people were going like, I would love to have that guarantee. I would love to have it. But it's only as good as I bring the next sacrifice. And that's Jesus Christ changed everything. Absolutely everything. And so, okay, um, so let's, let's um, 
talk about how this fits into our grid and, and all of that. Um, first off, we understand that there's a joyful sacrifice. A sacrifice is going to be asked of us. A sacrifice is going to be asked of us every single day. Just the question is, are we going to see it or not? God's going to ask us for a sacrifice every day. Just different a avenues, okay? The second, the second part of the grid is like what we were just talking about, that assurance of the glory of, of, of God. Um, but we're going to call it something different. I th it's a very important that we would have the assurance of the glory of God because we can't move in, in life, really, uh, fullness of life, if we don't have that. Um, but I want to apply it a little bit different, and that's to people that I meet and you meet every day. Okay, this assurance, this hope in us, this hope there. And that is this, and it's this, no one is too far gone. It, it doesn't matter, whoever it is that you meet, it doesn't matter what fronts people are throwing up in your face. It doesn't matter what kind of stuff spews out of their mouth or what's following behind them from their actions or what they're engaged in, not engaged with. No one on this planet is too far gone. In one breath, in one breath, a life can change and the hope of glory can enter into it. One breath, one breath, all, all it is, I mean, right, it's, it's as close as, as, as we are right now, right? All we have to do is call upon the name of the Lord. And, you know, it says that we'll be saved. And so we should be able to look at anybody's life, anyone's life, and say to ourselves, if he could save me, this person's no big deal. Right? And if you can't say that, if you go, well, I really wasn't that bad, maybe you need a whole refresher course on grace and what you've been saved from. So it provides a grid because what that means is, and, and follow me out on this, what that means every single day, there's a greater purpose in every person that I meet. I have a grid that I, that I can live through right now. I mean, there's a whole lot of improv going on in the day on how this works out in our conversations that I have or I don't have actions that I do or don't do. Um, but anyone I meet, I can look at them and go, you know, they're not too far gone. God's working on them. God's doing something there. Another grid closely related to this and be, of no one's too far gone is this one here, and that is we have a part in fulfilling God's word. Now hear me right on it. I'm not saying we're adding to God's word like that. I'm saying about God's word that he's revealed to us already. We have a part in it. Obviously, God used Paul in bringing the kingdom of God to people of that, of that day, right? Planting churches all, all around. I mean, look, he says that I'm going to fulfill, it's been given to me to fulfill the word of God. He wasn't talking about writing the word of God. He's talking about the ministry that he was engaged in, the stewardship of revealing it to people, calling people to faith. You know what? We also partake of the same. We are called, we are called, we've been commanded to share this message that has transformed our lives with other people. Like, man, God has given you great mercy. Give some mercy out to other people. God has transformed your life. Allow some other people to hear about this transformation. We have been commissioned to reach our generation. We, we have, right? And, and we play a part in that. And that part is where we are fulfilling God's word. Jesus commanded us to go to share this message, speak the message of Jesus Christ. One way that I can do that is simply by inviting someone to church. One is just come and see. Come and see. You know, I, I mean, you know, for some people, it might be that I just offer a word of encouragement. For some, it's just that I'm going to love on them a little bit. For some, I'm going to be able to share my testimony or share some scripture with. For some, I'm just going to say, hey, you know, I know you're going through a lot. Why don't you just come to my church and see? I know there's a lot of upheaval going on in your life right now. Why don't you just come and see? I know you're having a hard time right now. Why don't you just come and see? I know you're suffering loss right now. Why don't you just come and see? You're uncertain about life, uncertain about where things are going, uncertain about war and politics. The news has sent you in a tithy and all that. Why don't you just come and see? See, there's a divine appointment awaiting for you and me today. And I hope that you keep it. It's exciting to know this. 
because God wants to meet us in a real way before the day even begins. So we could wake up in the morning and go like, all right, there's a divine appointment God has for me. I've just got to figure out where it is. And so make a joyful sacrifice. No one's too far gone. Fulfill God's word. Let's go on. Um, verse 28, him we preach, Jesus Christ we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we might present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And we're talking about perfect here. It means mature. That's, that's what that word means. We want people to become mature. That's why Paul preached. That's why he teached. That's why we go through the Bible verse by verse, okay? It's because we, my desire is that all of us would be mature, perfect in Christ Jesus. And he goes on, verse 29, he says, to this end I also labor, striving according to his workings, which works in me mightily. Real simple, God's working in me, he's working in you. Um, now we need to do the work of making sure that work comes out. In other words, God, God has this working thing going on in the follower of Jesus going on, and it is a good work, a good work that you can't earn, you can't deserve, and anything like that. And you enjoy it, you enjoy it, and that's a great thing. That's a great thing, abide in that, oh, that whole thing. Yes, but now we in turn want to make sure that that work is finding its way out, that it's being accomplished in our lives. In other words, this should be a little practical here, all that compassion that Jesus is pouring in in your morning, you're, you're, you know, you wake up in the morning, you're reading the Word, and Jesus just meets you there, and you're just like, wow, you know, God, you are so amazing. Your compassions never cease. He's not giving you all those compassions so that you can create this giant reservoir in your life and say, oh, when I'm a little bit dry, I'm going to draw from this reservoir and I've got lots of it there. No, he's giving you that compassion because there's a person that you're going to meet and he's going to need that compassion. But they don't know who Jesus is and you're the only Jesus that they're going to meet at this point in time. See, that mercy, all that mercy that you're experiencing from the Lord and you've been experiencing in your life, all of that, yeah, absolutely, Re receive it with joy, soak it up, be completely saturated in it but allow some other people to get wet by the same mercy. Amen. First Corinthians 1 tells the same thing about comfort. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation. Why? Well, that we might be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You know, he's already poured it into you. Now allow some of it to pour out onto other people. You get it, right? And so those experiences that you have with Jesus and with God, or, you know, we worship the Lord and we just have this awesome experience with them. They're not just for you. They're for others. And if you're greedy, here's the thing with them. If you're greedy with them, I'm not going to allow others to have mercy I've had a lot of mercy, but I want justice from you. You know, well, yeah, I've been forgiven a lot, but I can't forgive. Listen, if you, if you aren't being faithful with what you've been entrusted with, you're going to find you're, you're experiencing them less and less. And so maybe if you're in a spot in life where you're just going, you know, I just really haven't seen God work in my life at all. Maybe it's because you've been ignoring all those grids. And God's just been saying, hey, would you make a joyful sacrifice? Keep ignoring them. Why don't you make a joyful sacrifice? Hey, you know what? Just like what we were talking about right now, and it's our fourth thing on the grid. Hey, why don't you receive, and then in turn, look for that opportunity to give. And you're going to see God really active in your life. Chapter 2, verse 1. And I know, and I want you to know um, what great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, as, as for many who have not seen my face in the flesh. And so Paul had never been to Colossae, he had never been to Laodicea. He says, you haven't seen me face to face. He says, but I still nevertheless have this great conflict for you. And the word for conflict there isn't like I have something against you guys and you guys dissed me and now I'm angry at you. He's, what he's saying is, is I've got this agony. I agonize over you guys. I agonize over you. And what's the agonizing over? Well, he tells us, verse 2, that their hearts, that your hearts may be encouraged 
being knit together in love and obtaining all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is, this is what I agonize for you guys, that you would be encouraged in your heart, that you would be knit together in love, that you would attain all the riches of the knowledge, just the, the glory of God, that you would know that and that assurance of it, God's plan. That's what he agonized for them. Now, here's the, the deal with all of this. Um, this is what God has for them and has for us in Jesus Christ. It's what he has for us. And so the problem is when we don't have these, the problem isn't with God. The problem is with us. So there's something going on where there's a veil over my understanding, over my eyes, over my heart, or it's just plain and simple pride, and it keeps me from entering in to what's before me. There's, there's, there's the pathway to this fullness of, of life that God has, with this measured life that blesses God's heart. And so Paul says, I just agonize over you that, that you would enter into all this stuff, that your hearts might just be encouraged, that you would encourage others, that they would be knit together in love, and you would just be loving others, that you would just attain all the riches that are in Christ Jesus. You know, Paul was one of those people, if he agonized over these things, which, which he did, if he agonized over them, then he would be a person that would give them out. Because he's like, you can't be agonizing over them for me to have in my life if you're not giving them out of yourself, right? So like Paul has access to this love. If he's not loving others, well, how in the world can you tell somebody else, I agonize that you would love others. I'm not a peacemaker, but I agonize that you would be one. It's just like this saying, I really agonize over the fact that you don't have 10 bucks in your pocket right now, but I'm not going to give you my 10 bucks. Well, you no, know, you're not really agonizing then over it. Okay? That's not real. And so the grid, the grid here that we're talking about, it would look for opportunity to give encouragement. It would look for opportunity to knit together people in love. And it would give such things out as well, right? It would look for opportunity to share of this treasure that's been entrusted to me, and I would share it with others, of knowing Jesus more and more. And what's found is, what's found is, as you look for this opportunity and, you, and you're giving your life away, you end up finding life, right? You find that when you seek to bless others, your heavenly Father is blessed, and then so are you. You find when you inconvenience yourself, your heavenly Father will inconvenience himself. If you draw near to God, if you want, and if you want to draw near to God, you're going to bless and you're going to serve others. These are just the ways of the kingdom. There's the ways of the kingdom. And you will find ample opportunity in your day. You'll find there's going to be plenty of times throughout your day where you're going to be in a situation of where, man, I can, I can encourage someone, that I can be united in love with someone, that I could share the riches that have been entrusted to me. And so the last thing on our grid there is, is to look for opportunity. Ask that your eyes be open to the opportunity. So for us, Look, you can wake up knowing in the morning that God is active in your life and that God wants you to participate in his kingdom. You can wake up just knowing that. It's just a fact. But if you're going to walk in that, you're going to look for that sacrifice, that joyful sacrifice he's asking you to make today. It's, and it might be as simple as doing the right thing. That's, it might just be that. That's the sacrifice he wants you to do. It might be saying an encouraging word. It, it might be um, loving somebody that you view as being unlovable or giving something up of my resources. It, it might be giving up of some trust that I have in myself to trust Jesus in this because it sure doesn't make sense, but I'm going to trust you anyway. I don't know what it is. It's different for you. It might be a suffering that you have to endure for the time, but you need to be able to, and I need to be able to make a joyful sacrifice. There's going to be something else of you today. Second is, look, no one is, no one is, is too far gone. He's, you're going to have people in, in your life and you're, God's going to say, no, I don't want you to look at their exterior like that. Nothing's too hard. Their hearts isn't too, nothing's too hard for me. Do your part in fulfilling God's word. 
Do your part in that. And, you know, uh, encourage, love, um, share God's word, invite someone to church, do it. Look, and receive, receive, and in turn give. Look, you've been given so much mercy. You've been, giving un- you've been given forgiveness of sins. Look, you've been forgiven of so much. Give it out. Just give it out. There's going to be lots of opportunity. Um, and you might look and go, ooh, that person really needs it right there. And so give it to them. Um, and then look for opportunity. Look, many people don't see God active in their life because they're not looking for him to be. This is a grid. And it's a grid that Paul, when we look at Paul's letters, and we see Paul seemed to use this grid and as a result of this grid, things filtered through it, and his life was used to the fullest. His life was a life that pleased God. And you know what? We can have the same exact thing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Um, your word is just amazing, Lord, amazing. And we just stand in awe of you, awe of the work that you're doing. Thank you that you rescued us, Lord. You've given us that, um, that opportunity to be rescued. We ask that we would grab hold of these things, that our eyes would be open to the sacrifices around us today, that we might see you active the way that you want us to see you. In Jesus' name, amen.